Hello, everyone. It is nice to, uh, well, virtually be reaching out to you. <laughs> this is Mr. Mink. Hi. Um, sorry we can't have the usual back and forth that we do in a class. Still working on options and possibilities for that. Uh, probably something along some kind of a forum that we can do for the meantime. But one way or another, I know that a few of you are emailing asking about the possibility of doing uh, lectures that seemed a little bit more like the lectures in class. So whether we'll have the back and forth of questioning and building on each other's knowledge that we usually do in class, that's an open question that we're going to be working on as time goes by. But in the meantime, I'd like to be able to at least give you a little bit more rich detail with regard to what it is that you're reading than uh, what you've been having so far just looking at the outline to these uh, lectures. So I'd like you to take a look in this video. We're going to go back a few slides technically on where the slideshow is. And we are going to be actually going back to the slide that has the scramble for Africa today because we are going to continue to talk about what was happening in Africa and uh, what was happening with regard to European colonialism. So you just did an assignment on the Berlin Conference where you read some of the actual direct information and some of the, uh, some of the text from the Berlin Conference where they set the rules for dividing up Africa. So the nations were Austria, Hungary, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Russia, Spain, Sweden, and Norway, which were unified from 1814 to 1905. Turkey and the United States was involved. Uh, France, Germany, Great Britain, and Portugal. Those are in there, sorry. Uh, so those are already, those are the countries that actually had the national leaders meeting at the Berlin Conference. And they set the rules for dividing up Africa. Let's note that no Africans were invited to this gathering. Um, the initial task of the conference was to agree that the Congo River and the Niger River mouths and basins would be considered neutral and open to trade. Remember what we had talked about with those before? We had talked about Stanley, right? Henry Morton Stanley, who had just mapped the Congo River Basin, which is on your map here that you're looking at over toward the western side of Africa, it's the blue area, the Congo River. This area had never been mapped by Europeans because now there was an anti-malarial drug called quinine that was beginning to work. Malaria, of course, is a mosquito-borne illness that can cause extremely severe, deadly uh, disease to people who get it, except for some people in Africa who are have lived there for a long time who have an adaptation to that, which can cause other health problems. It's actually called sickle cell, and it can cause a, a condition called sickle cell anemia, but it also gives people a certain degree of resistance to malaria. So it's an important adaptation. This Up until this point, there were no Europeans who had this genetic mutation adaptation, and so they had to take this uh, medication, which now is allowing them to go deeper and deeper into the continent because it would help keep malaria from developing into a serious disease, which changed the, the uh, calculus in the continent subst substantially. So as we saw before, 80% of Africa was under local control in 1884. But then when the scramble for Africa started to happen, it was divided up. Of course, that's not going to just happen because they just decided at a table, there's going to have to be a bunch of things that establish the actual rule for these different countries that are going to decide that they are suddenly going to be in control of an entire region of the world in which they previously had a minimal presence, mostly on the coasts and at different ports. So they set the ground rules for declaring a colony. So the ground rules for declaring these colonies by the European powers were called the principle of effective occupation which essentially means if you can't completely control the area, then you don't have a claim over it. Uh, also, they decided that the Congo and Niger rivers would be neutral territory for trading. That's not to say that the borders of them, that the banks on each side wouldn't be different territories. And in fact, they were. The Congo and Niger rivers both made uh, different borders between different countries that were now being established as countries, even though they probably were not prior to this. As we talked about, the slave trade was outlawed. And I had you think about that question, right? So as you thought about that question, maybe we're thinking about how the Industrial Revolution was, in devel was developing in Europe and in the United States, and how workers, the nature of work was changing. 
and how now a lot of what was needing to be done was actually processing of raw materials in various parts of the world. And as the nature of work changed and as uh, pr industrial production became more standard, it actually became in some ways too expensive to deal with slaves. And also there was a great deal of moral outrage. And that moral outrage to slavery and the abolition movement also played into some manipulations that some of these powers, uh, these European powers were able to take advantage of. In particular, somebody who we'll talk about a lot today, and that's Leopold II, the King of Belgium. Please note that after the Berlin Conference, only Liberia, which is in West Africa, and it's a colony governed by former slaves from the United States, still is actually by, ex by uh, the descendants of those slaves. Only Liberia and Ethiopia, which is in the Far East, were left as independent countries and regions. So we talked about why the Berlin Conference decided to outlaw slavery in Africa. Here is what Africa looked like. You can see in the image in the lower left, Africa in 1878, and then Africa after 1884. It is dramatically different in terms of how it was carved up. There were all of these different countries and these different groups that had different political control before. Uh, and they were there were different empires, there were different groups, there were the Sudanese empires, there were all of these different groups that were controlling things, the Bantu kingdoms, different groups that controlled different regions of the country. But now it was carved up by Europeans at this conference, and what remained was for them to move in and effectively dominate these areas through total economic, political, and military control and exploit them for their resources. And a lot of this involved the moving in of a lot of different settlers to these areas. So you can see this is in 1913. Uh, you're also seeing the modern day boundaries, which are pretty similar to the, co to the colonial era boundaries, right? You can see what countries controlled the most. So take a look at this. Which country seems to control the most looking at it? If you guess France has a heck of a lot, you were right. France and uh, Great Britain actually had the biggest chunks of territory. And as we're going to talk about, this also plays into the way the dynamics were going into World War I. But there's one really big area in the middle there, right, that's controlled by Belgium. And that's the Congo. And it's around the Congo River, which is particularly rich in natural resources. And we will be getting deeply into what was happening there coming up today. So the French colonies... Uh, which were basically mainly in West Africa. West Africa was rich in gold and diamonds, right? So you had all these important trade posts and all these different missions to quote unquote turn colonized peoples into French citizens. Uh, a few thousand of them did it out of many, many millions of people. Um, and they practiced a thing called direct rule. So these countries were essentially owned and directly governed by the French government. The French government would set up their own colonial administrations in the country, so that it's part of France, of course. They were not treated as though they were equal citizens of France, but that was how, um, how it was treated. So in these irregular countries, the French chunk was quite, quite large. Uh, and so we ended up having a situation where France took possession of it from Mauritania to Chad, which was French West Africa, also Gabon and the Republic of Congo, which was French Equatorial Africa, which is next to the big Congo in the middle there. French became the official language, although, of course, people still spoke their local languages, but French was a language of government and commerce. And direct rule was happening. The German colonies, which also uh, practiced direct rule, were driven by competition and commerce. But the thing is, is that Germany unified really late. It, German, it unified in the 1880s. And as such, it did not get the most resource-rich areas. It was late to the game. It had not established these lucrative trading ports on the, on, the, uh, on the coasts. And so they were driven by competition and commerce. They had a very brutal kind of rule, uh, big company charters and settlements. So sort of like what you read about in India with the Dutch East India Company from Britain that is, and, and uh, originally Holland and the British East India Company that controlled India as basically a giant company town for a long, long time. Uh, Germany essentially did that too. They had big companies that would run entire countries and they would have big settlements of Germans that would live within the country, much like in the French settlements as well. And so there's a lot of indigenous resistance that led to brutal suppression. Uh, they called it muscle over patience. Uh, one of those 
incidents down in the lower left at the far in the far uh, west of the country there uh, in the, what is now Namibia uh, over 100 at least 100,000 Herero people uh, an indigenous group were killed in what is now uh, Namibia between 1904 and 1907 it was the first genocide of the 20th century extremely extremely brutal uh, situation they were actually um, left without they, the the Germans kicked them out of their villages and forced them out into the desert where entire um, societies would just starve and and uh, run out of water and died in the desert so very very brutal um, very brutal practices and this disparity in control in Africa too between Germany and France and as we'll find out Britain and even uh, Belgium led to some of the bitterness that ended up creating the situation that created that in the end generated World War I. So you already did this Berlin Conference worksheet. And uh, those 14 nations agreed through it that there would be freedom of trade and navigation in the Congo Basin, right? And they agreed that any power that annexed territory or established a protectorate from that day forward let every other country know immediately. So the same time the country was responsible for establishing political stability, guaranteeing that effective occupation. Um, and they part of the reason they started to stop that slave trade is because they didn't want, quote, these territories to serve as a market or means of transit for the trade of slaves of whatever race they may be. And as we'll find out in the Congo, that was because they wanted people to work there under conditions that were not, that, you know, one could argue might not be a hell of a lot better. So the Belgian Congo get into stuff you haven't seen yet. This was an enormous and diverse region. Uh, by the way, in Belgium, you see in the, the book down there, Congo Belge, Alei, uh, that's because in Belgium, the primary language was France, also English was spoken. Um, but France, French was the, uh, was the primary language. Uh, so Belgium was a brand new country. And uh, this Belgian Congo had actually been a major source for slaves during the 1700s. Other groups would be fighting over different areas of it. It was a kind of meeting point for a few different indigenous African empires and uh, different war captives would be sent to the coasts where they would be, where they would end up being sent off to the Americas as slaves, um, being bought by Europeans and sent off as slaves. Oftentimes, as noted before, the African uh, people who were capturing them were not aware of how they would be treated as less than human as actually property because that's not how slaves were generally treated within Africa. But um, that's what ended up happening in the big picture. So this area was given to Belgium during the Berlin Conference. It was a new country. It wanted to compete with the industrial powers of Europe. So uh, we ended up with Leopold II, who was the king of Belgium, and he, uh, he ran it as his personal possession. It was direct rule over this area. Again, some of the most brutal and direct, uh, overwhelming occupation that happened in Africa during this time. There's an immense source of profit in this region from rubber mine, rubber vines. Uh, also, there was ivory, which comes from elephants, elephant tusks, and there was mining, uh, particularly for diamonds and gold. Rubber vines. Why rubber vines? Well, think about machines for a moment. How can machines use rubber? If you guessed belts, if you guessed different parts of wheels and uh, bumpers and all kinds of different parts of machines, you're correct. If you look inside of a car engine, you're gonna see a lot of rubber. If you look inside of a big industrial machine, you're gonna see a lot of rubber. It was a very durable material and they learned how to harden it through something called vulcanizing process, which involves firing it, which made it even more, um, useful for industrial manufacturing. And also there's suddenly a bunch of cars that are starting to get made in the early 1900s and they need rubber for tires. So rubber became a big deal. And rubber comes from vines in rainforests that you have to tap for rubber and the rubber trickles out of it and you collect it in little cups. And it's an extremely brutal process to collect it. By the way, there's Belgium. That should just give you an idea looking at the map of how small Belgium is compared to the Congo. Obviously, the maps are different scales, right? But Belgium is a pretty small country. So it's huge. The, the Congo is huge. It's got rainforest. It's got minerals. It's ecologically diverse and culturally diverse. 
many, many different groups that are living within this region, uh, sometimes in conflict with each other, but for millennia, thousands of years, people were living together. It was a, it was a very uh, diverse and complicated region prior to European conquest. So I want you to stop right here now, and I want you to go to the, your email or to wherever it is that you downloaded the file, and I want you to read the Proverbs of the Congo worksheet, okay? So I want you to download that worksheet for Proverbs of the Congo. I want you to answer the prompts, and I want you to do this on your um, class work document as you've been doing with other assignments, okay? So answer the prompts on the Proverbs of the Congo worksheet, and then do that before you proceed on to the next slide. So we're going to pause right here, okay? As you do that work, you're going to do that during this class period. So you've done the Proverbs of the Congo worksheet, which gives you a snapshot of sorts of some of the ways of life and the way that people thought who lived in the Congo, who were indigenous to that region, and what kind of life ways they had, what kind of respect they had. I want you to think about the ways that they interacted with each other the ways that they uh, socialized and the ways that they interacted with other people in their society and their villages and with outsiders and other people who are from different villages in different areas, as well as their elders. So think about these things as you go into what we're learning further with how the European occupation of the Congo unfolded. And I want you to think about how those values that people had in the society came into complicated conflict with what was happening with this new type of rule that was being imposed on them from outside through colonization. So looking into the, the European occupation of Congo, we, can't, we have to start in the 1700s thinking about the slave trade that was happening there, where many, many slaves had been taken, particularly during wars. Um, and again, as we've talked about, Within Africa, generally, slavery was treated more like indentured servitude, where people would serve someone to um, pay off a, a debt one way or the other that would be for a set amount of time. Oftentimes, they would end up being freed, sometimes even paid partially for work they did. Sometimes people would end up becoming part of the different society that they were enslaved in and intermarry. They were recognized as human and as from another culture, even though they were not always treated, treated very well while they were still enslaved. This began to change during the 1700s, uh, during the slave trade period, as more and more Africans were taken uh, to the coast by traders from particularly from North Africa, and then sold to uh, Europeans to bring over to the Americas as slaves, where they ex endured extremely brutal conditions and were treated differently than humans. They were treated essentially as livestock. It was called chattel slavery which is based on the idea of viewing human beings uh, who, as property, which is a very different mindset than it was for slaves within Africa. So this was a very, a very different thing that was happening. Um, and uh, it transformed the way that these different economies functioned, both within and around each other. And it's really important to remember how, how different those systems were. And also think about things like social Darwinism that Europeans, uh, the Europeans did to continue to justify the actions they were doing, the colonial actions that they were doing in the period. Um, so moving in the 1850s, rubber, ivory, and gold became very important. So rubber in particular, what was happening up to this point? Think about it for a second. What was the big event that we learned about? If you guessed the Industrial Revolution, then you are correct. It was the Industrial Revolution and rubber became extremely valuable to it. Then in the 1870s, Stanley went up the Congo. So uh, Henry Morton Stanley. And again, this was with the aid of new anti-malarial drugs that allowed Europeans to be able to explore Africa's interior for the first time that had been off limits because of disease that, that Europeans simply did not have immunities enough to. And so this now allowed them to be able to resist that disease, malaria. So the interior was opened up. Um, and so Europeans started to move into the interior of Africa. Meanwhile, in this period, slavery had been largely abolished in much of the world for the, in the, the previous decades, over the last 60 or 70 years. Slowly, 
but through a whole bunch of different events around the world that we've learned a bit about, both through abolitionist ideas, but also through different economic changes that were happening. Um, and as slavery was fading, it became a more and more popular thing to become an abolitionist. And so the uh, International Association of the Congo was formed in 1878 by King Leopold, who was the king of Belgium, which was a new country who wanted to compete with the industrial powers of Europe. And so he switched from a lot of this old model of exploitation through slavery, but he formed a uh, ostensibly, like a theoretically a charitable company called the International Association of the Congo, like a nonprofit, which in theory had economic goals, but was still closely related to a lot of the other issues. So Leopold, what he did was he um, he ended up saying that the reason for the occupation of the Congo by the Belgium was to spread commerce, Christianity, and civilization. And this was the reason for his, uh, essentially his, what he would consider to be his civilizing uh, organization that was moving in there. I want you to think about what kind of commerce is happening. Also, what the nature is of Christianity in a place where it has not necessarily been spread yet, and also what civilization means. Because there were certainly people there who had their own societies prior. So think about that in the sense of what we just learned with the Congolese proverbs and everything else about African culture. So it's important to note here as well, Leopold had U.S. and European support. And uh, he was publicly part of the whole point of his uh, International Association of the Congo is that it was a very openly anti-slavery group, anti-slavery uh, association. But the thing is, is that his forced labor policies that he ended up uh, creating in the Congo and his through his surrogates uh, for native people there were extremely brutal and very difficult to distinguish from slavery in the end. It's just that people were not exported. They were working within the areas where they are from. Um, so this is a very, very important thing to recognize. And so there were brutal production demands for rubber that were set. So Leopold's idea of a Congo free state with himself as the full sovereign ruler, theoretically with the Congo based as a free, free trade zone, but most of the work being done for the benefit of Leopold II. Um, it was very, very important to remember that this was being driven for uh, creating products that were going to fuel the increasingly expanding industrial revolution, in particular rubber. And the brutal forced labor policies included some very, very extreme extreme treatments of human beings, including the fact that if a worker did not meet his daily quota for how much rubber he was supposed to produce, he could be beaten or killed, and his family could be held hostage or killed. So the United States were supporting him. Uh, he sent the United States President Chester Arthur carefully edited copies of uh, treaties with people, which were, you know, usually with one or two local rulers in an area, and then that would bring every, or local people who would put themselves out as representatives for some benefit of their own, but then everybody else would end up being forced labor. Um, the United States was growing in, in its military and economic power, and so the recognition of the United States was very, very important. Uh, he brought some, some congressmen from the U.S. South. Uh, to show them that the Congo Free State could be a new home for freed slaves, because there was a lot of movement in the U.S. at that point to try to relocate slaves from the United States, ex-former slaves, into the Congo. And remember, the U.S. Civil War had only ended in, in the 1860s, in 1865. So nobody, none of the colonial powers in Africa, please remember, none of the colonial powers in Africa, not the Dutch, the British, the French, the Germans, the Spanish, nor the Italians have clean hands. But as we'll learn, what happened in Belgium or in the Congo with uh, Leopold II was a genocide, without any other way of describing it. It, it, it was a genocide, and uh, he managed to convince the major powers to agree to let him have his way, with the pretext of it being a civilizing mission. As he says here in the bottom, a quote from Leopold. Our goal is to open to civilization the only part of the globe where it has yet to penetrate. It is, dare I say, 
a crusade worthy of this century of progress. In bringing you to Brussels, which is the capital of Belgium, I was in no way motivated by selfish design. So he, he portrayed it as a humanitarian mission. But ultimately, uh, his plan was to, in fact, bleed the, bleed the laborers of the Congo dry and murder them if they resisted. So I want you to think about how his stated mission in this prompt of commerce, Christianity, and civilization, how does that reflect or conflict with the actions being taken on his behalf in the Congo? Please write that out in your class document. Take a pause here to do that. Okay, so as you think about, you're unpausing now, uh, moving on, as you think about this prompt, about this stated mission reflects or conflicts of the actions being taken on his behalf. I want you to think more seriously about those three words and how they reflect with what's going on in the Congo at this period of time. So again, to recap here, there's the International Africa Association, which was established to theoretically develop and improve the lives of African people. It was a ruse, it was a, it was a cover for Leopold's personal exploitation of Africa. So he actually hired Stanley, who had gone up the Congo uh, River originally as his personal explorer and envoy. And again, with US support, he managed to take control of the entire region with, uh, with soldiers and different companies. Um, in 1884, at the Berlin Conference, almost 1 million square miles of the Congo came under his control. This is all a recap, right? And it became his personal kingdom from 1885 to 1906, so over 20 years. So the international view and tied into what was happening is that there's profitability in the area that was maximized through the principle of terras vacantes, which was quote unquote vacant land. And these are areas that were theoretically without permanent settlement or long-term agriculture, uh, which is most of the region because a lot of times villages would move during different seasons to take advantage of different areas and different things that were happening. Although generally it was tropical and there wasn't a lot of change, but there was definitely a wet season and a dry season. And so sometimes people would move to areas that would be, have different things growing at different times. And so these are areas, uh, some of the areas that permanent settlement or long-term agriculture uh, would be considered to be this vacant land. Although oftentimes these are areas that were already claimed by local people who lived there. Um, as their own property, but this was not necessarily recognized unless it was being actively exploited for uh, economic purposes. And so instantly, any of these terras vacantes belonged to the state. Any pro pro products harvested on them could only sell them to the state. So it was exclusively the property of the state, which would be Leopold, which would be Belgium. Uh, and also bear in mind that land could become vacant through removing the people who were on it. And so over time, all lands that were not being exploited by people working for Leopold became defined as terras vacantes. As all of this started to change, everything that was not specifically exploited by people working for Leopold in Belgium became defined as vacant land. So that it began to include permanent villages and permanent long-term agricultural settlements of people who were indigenous people there. Um, in 1889, there was an anti-slavery conference Europe and the U.S. saw Leopold as a humanitarian at this because of the way that he presented himself. He was very good at presenting a, uh, a charitable front and that he was doing a good thing, civilizing Africa. But uh, the reality, of course, on the ground was very different. There was a rubber boom. So rubber was becoming more and more valuable. The market for tires skyrocketed as more and more vehicles were being sold. It was extremely uh, lucrative a very lucrative industrial product. And the, the raw stuff came from Africa, uh, particularly from this region. It actually came from wild vines in the jungle. There's rubber from Brazil to South America too, which was tapped from trees, a slightly different type. But the rubber that they used and that they were getting from, uh, from Central Africa were from vines. And you would have to slash the vines, and which was very, very difficult and a lot of work in deep, thick jungle. In the end, this brutal labor that was required to that, and we'll get into what happened, uh, resulted in 50% of the population of the Congo dying. Up to 10 million people were killed, often violent.
um, extremely, extremely brutal rule. So rubber vines were dangerous. Uh, when they were having to get them, you could see that. Well, you could see a man here in the picture over on the left, slicing and slashing the vines to get the uh, rubber out, where it would drip into a pot below. And so what they would have to do is they would slash them, and then they would get them in this pot, and to get it out, they would have to cover their bodies with the rubber latex. So they would actually slather this from the pot all over their bodies in layers, and then when the latex hardened, they would scrape it off the skin with another blade which would often take off the worker's hair with it. It was a very, very brutal system. Um, the quota system was extremely, extremely brutal. The Congo state had a, um, uh, the Congo Free State, which is Belgium, you know, Belgium's forces there. Uh, now they called it the Congo Free State. They had a force publique, which tortured or murdered villages who did not, villagers who did not cooperate. As some villagers did not want to be part of the system, but they had no choice. Uh, in this period, troops also had to end up accounting for ammunition they expended, and we'll get into what happens with that. So the bullets had to be accounted for. Every bullet that they used had to be accounted for. So for every bullet that was used, a human hand had to be presented because they had to cut off the hands of people they shot to prove they had not been using the bullets for hunting animals instead of shooting humans who were disobeying. So frequently they cut the hands off of living people including very small children. So these are very graphic photos and um, they show the, the brutality of what was happening at the time. Uh, on the left, there is a man being, uh, being whipped by an overseer for um, a man being whipped for, for not meeting his quota uh, with vines. And then on the right, you can see people whose 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 hands have actually been removed. They've had their hands chopped off, uh, which were which was done frequently when the force publique, the uh, the police, the the Belgian police, were trying to account for bullets that they used. They would chop the hands off of living people, and of course, then this would also send a message to people in the villages, because the question there is, what would you see if you were what what ends up happening when you end up getting somebody from your family who is working, who then has a hand removed. What kind of guesses do you have for that? Well, it makes them dependent on the family. So that person cannot work, yet they're dependent on the family, which then makes the people in the family who can work have to work more to be able to take care of them. So there is extra incentive to not, to, to meet, to, for people to meet their quotas, to be able to exceed them, in fact, and produce more so that they can continue to feed their family, many of whom have been maimed by the people who are overseeing the labor. It's an inhuman system, genocidal. So if you were a traveler to the Congo, and this is prompt number four, this is what I want you to think about. This is prompt number four. Uh, I want you to think about, as a traveler to the Congo, what could you do? And what would you do? So think about what you could do and what you would do in the Congo. I want you to write this. You're going to hit, hit pause right now, okay? Hit pause. And then I want you to write about this and then unpause when you're ready. So as you're thinking about this, what you could do and what you would do as a traveler to the Congo, of course you're thinking about how it's difficult to feel any sort of sense of being able to change anything as an individual in such a very difficult environment and such a, a brutal system, right? And it's hard to change things as an individual. Also, we're talking about a period of time when uh, the, there were not necessarily internationally recognized ideas of human rights. These ideas were just starting and they were just in the very, very beginning phases. And in fact, as we will find out, travelers to the Congo, people who went to the Congo for various reasons, did in fact manage to do things that changed the situation and started to also establish the groundwork for what would become an international idea of what civil rights are. So there ended up being some international response. The British uh, started to become more aware of it from trade with the region and, like, and the word getting out, especially from, uh, from missionaries who were going into the Congo. 
um, oftentimes who did not do anything to stop the brutality, but did come back with stories of it and were disturbed by it. So um, the first person to actually publicly speak out, who was George Washington Williams, uh, who was an intellectual from the United States, and he publicly spoke out about against human rights abuses in Congo, 1890. Uh, what George Washington Williams was was the son of the child of slaves from the United States, and he had come as part of a mission to Africa to uh, observe conditions. And so he was more than willing to put himself out there and take this uh, take this in you know th this this movement. Uh, and so he accused Leopold of being guilty of crimes committed in his name. He called for an international commission to investigate. And he was actually one of the first modern, this ended up becoming one of the first modern human rights campaigns uh, where, where there was actually a lot of awareness was being built around this. And meanwhile, Leopold continued to earn enormous wealth in the region. Uh, the, the, machine, the machinery of the genocide did not stop. So in the 1890s as well, another person also became part of this. E.D. Morell worked for a British shipping company and he stumbled on what he described as a secret society of murders. Uh, and that was what he was talking about as basically being the entire culture within the Congo Free State that had been established by the Belgians. He saw ships co going to the Congo with guns, chains, ammo, and explosives, and then they'd come back to Belgium with rubber, ivory, and minerals. So there was obviously a war of some sort going on here or an extreme type of oppression. And the word about how vast it had gotten had it been, it was just beginning to be on the verge of leaking out. And Morel alerted other people to this and started writing about it. This began to create an international fear, or there was an international fear, it didn't create it. There was already an international fear of people actually standing up to Leopold II. But public interest began to be raised. So public interest started to wonder what was happening and why this was such an extreme circumstance. You can see an example of it in this uh, newspaper cartoon from the same period called In the Rubber Coils, which has a snake. And who is a, whose head is on that snake? If you guessed Leopold, you were correct. So the international response culminated uh, with British consul Sir Roger Casement. He was a, uh, he was a reporter and he was actually asked to write a report on the Congo. And he was from Northern Ireland, in fact. Um, his case, the casement report actually ended up being result, uh, its result was testimony. He went in and interviewed people in different villages. He went to villages all over the country. And so he, he interviewed Congolese people and missionaries who were there and produced the casement report that came out. Uh, this became very, very important uh, and ended up being a a major, uh, a major piece of, of journalism and also a government report to Britain as they discussed what they could do with regard to Belgium's actions. And so in 1903, he started the Congo Reform Association with E.D. Morel, the shipper. And so this began to put the machinery in motion to maybe get some changes going and start to establish some ideas of what human rights should look like. Uh, in 1906, Morel wrote the book Red Rubber, the story of the rubber slave trade flourishing on the Congo. And the, the lid on this whole enterprise was starting to blow wide open. So we're going to be doing this as the last prompt for the day, prompt number five, and write it in your notes. If you were a foreign government with knowledge of the atrocities in the Congo, what would you do? If you were a foreign government with knowledge of the atrocities in the Congo, what would you do? So I want you to write about that, think about it today, and we will come right back to it in the next class. Thank you for your attention and attentiveness, and I look forward to working with you more in the next day or two. Talk to you next week.